I'm going to begin recording forthwith. And uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, knowing that at least one person got that joke. Um, okay, um, so uh, welcome. Um, today's uh, material is really going to uh, jump into coverage of um, one of the three um, major modeling traditions. Um, this will be following a pattern of spiral learning through the class. Uh, so um, as I had articulated uh, last week, um, the course is designed in a spiral way. Last time we saw a brief, the very briefest glimpse of three major modeling traditions, um, system dynamics modeling, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation. And today we're going to be um, embarking on somewhat more textured discussion of each of these with an eye towards informing uh, selection of method for projects, um, with an eye towards um, orienting you to some of their differences um, up front, um, differences not only in the methods, the, the, the kind of the languages used to describe things and their semantics, um, uh, the nature of time in each tradition and, and uh, the, the, the level at which we characterize things, but the different questions being asked, okay? And um, so today we're going over system dynamics, next time agent-based modeling, next, uh, the time after that discrete event simulation. We'll then discuss uh, some topics or ask you to watch videos on topics common to all and, uh, and then dive uh, at, a, at a deeper level into uh, each of these traditions, but, but bearing in mind that some of the principles we'll be learning can apply across all traditions because they are principles not of, um, that are privileged to, to one specific tradition, but indeed uh, uh, carry over. Um, and I'll, I'll be trying to highlight those things. Um, the, the course as a whole is designed to illuminate the fact that these three traditions have more commonalities than they do differences, despite the partisan sniping you'll, you'll hear be, behind, uh, between them um, at a professional level. Okay, um, so uh, enough on a uh, preface. Um, I'd like to uh, switch to slides. Um, and so I'm just going to get the, the presentation up uh, here and I will uh, seek to share my screen. And I'm going to ask for confirmation from confirmation from people here. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Bearing in mind that my view of the chat is occluded by the slides. Um, could anyone uh, uh, offer a verbal utterance? Yeah, we can see it. Yep, we can see your yeah, screen. Can okay, see. thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I promise to... Uh, yeah, I can see and it. not only your knowledge of modeling here, but indeed uh, your knowledge of English. Um, okay, uh, so um, an introduction to system dynamics modeling, just very, very high level system dynamics modeling is a feedback oriented perspective. It focuses on these feedbacks, which we'll be seeing in more detail, balancing feedbacks, reinforcing feedbacks and system composed of the interactions between them. And it's a broad evolving methodology that's really focused on managing these systems, but uh, and on way towards that, conceptualizing them, describing them and analyzing them. Um, and it has many manifestations at different levels. One of the things that system dynamics uh, prizes compared to other traditions is, is something which um, occurs on a spectrum of modeling, uh, uh, sort of modeling progression that, that carries over to all the dynamic modeling traditions. Um, all of these three traditions to some degree go through stages, although some of those stages are uh, sometimes grievously shortchanged for any one uh, tradition. Um, there's a problem conceptualization phase, a problem mapping phase, where we sort of sketch out, much as you might do in software design with UML diagrams or you know, sketching down a class diagram or an interaction diagram. Uh, here we, we map out a system visually um, to, to help us understand it. This can go on in agent-based modeling. It can go on in system dynamics modeling and it traditionally is emphasized there. And it can go on discrete event modeling. Later, there's successive stages that are, are really avowedly um, quantitative in nature, model formulation, calibration, testing, et cetera. 
Um, hopefully we'll have time in this course uh, for a uh, coverage of this process later in this semester. And I believe it's scheduled in there. Um, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of this first stage because it actually gets into how we'll illustrate some of the diagrams that are quantitative in nature at the model formulation stage, okay? And the, the sort of foremost tool within system dynamics at the qualitative mapping stage is something called a causal loop diagram. And um, we're not, in past years of this course, and indeed sometimes in other courses, I've uh, held forth on um, how to use uh, uh, causal loop diagrams to characterize systems. And it can be very insightful. Um, it can be especially useful when dealing with stakeholders who are not modelers. But um, this year we were focusing on, on quantitative uh, side of, of dynamic modeling, and we're, we're going to shortchange that a little bit in favor of other, um, other topics. Um, you can find my videos on it. It's fairly easy to learn. Um, causal loop diagrams, uh, but it carries over to formal quantitative diagrams within system dynamics, prize the representation of feedback because feedback is at the front and center when it comes to system dynamics model. And, and basically it's, it's characterizing these situations where a given change in the system kicks off a kind of series of changes, cascade of changes that, that either amplify that original change or push back against it, okay? Um, and uh, and we, we indicate within diagrams when we have a causal loop of this sort, a, um, uh, uh, this causal feedback, because it's so important in dynamic behavior. And, and this gets to my demonstration. Introducing a feedback can fundamentally alter a system's behavior, okay? Um, it can fundamentally change a system that's unstable, that um, can quickly go off the rails, quickly diverge, uh, you know, think about uh, a, a massive growth in the number of infectives here in Saskatchewan from COVID-19. Um, and it can change that into a system which is well controlled, where there's a lid kept on it. Um, that would be introducing a balancing feedback that as the situation go, wor grows worse, it exercises more and more effort, more and more vaccination effort, more and more case finding effort, more and more uh, rapid diagnosis, more and more uh, effective, um, uh, effective social distancing and public health measures that you've all come to love and hate probably more the latter, um, but um, uh, these, these measures scaled up can help put a lid on how, how quickly it diverges. And to show this point that feedback can fundamentally alter uh, systems behavior, I'm going to ask your accommodation for a change in angle indeed of this camera, okay? So I'm going to um, uh, point it to uh, yonder uh, room there. And uh, I have a, um, a rod to demonstrate this principle. And uh, I will be a little bit distant from you to give myself appropriate headroom. Um, hopefully you can uh, still hear me here. Can, can you folks uh, hear me even from this distant uh, uh, distant place? Yes. yes. Well, my condolences. Okay, so I'm going to place this rod on my finger. This is an exercise uh, likely most of you have uh, engaged in while you were children. And perhaps it's not limited to your childhood. But if I put this rod on my, on my finger here um, and uh, I close my eyes, it's gonna beam me in the head or it's gonna fall down you know, opposite. Um, I, I can't judge what's going on with it. There's no feedback from my visual system. And um, so if it starts to fall, I'm not able to anticipate it and head it off. I'm not able to compensate for it and restabilize it. By contrast, you know, if I have my eyes wide open um, uh, and I engage in, in appropriate feedback behavior, I can keep this rod elevated um, more or less vertically for extended periods of time. And to your disappointment, um, we won't spend the balance of the class engaged in that exercise, but I think it, um, it carries the essential point here. Look, um, adding a feedback to a system, in this case, a balancing feedback, a compensatory feedback, a feedback that regulates 
the system that that um, that sees a change and uh, works to bring it under control by by moving my hand to to keep it under the uh, the center of gravity of, of this rod. Um, it can fundamentally alter systems behavior. One that would beat me in the head um, and uh, potentially mercifully uh, end the lecture early to something that uh, will sustain it um, for its full um, and painful duration. Um, so uh, adding a feedback uh, fundamentally changes uh, system behavior. And that's why we, within system dynamics, feedbacks are at the very center of uh, system dynamics focus. It's why, you know, in uh, the very uh, first substantive slide here, I said it's a feedback oriented perspective. Feedbacks are where it's at often in terms of understanding why we see certain behavior, why we, you know, the, the cycle of poverty is so difficult to break, um, why we see, you know, growths and collapse in, um, in snowshoe hair population in Hudson Bay records um, from Northern Canada, including from the, um, fr from the north of our fair province. Uh, it's why we see, uh, you know, situations where uh, through appropriate public health efforts, we can prevent a uh, disaster um, from, um, from reaching its full proportion uh, here in Canada to COVID-19, whereas uh, health systems that are, have uh, impoverished responses, uh, such as those of a close neighbor, um, uh, you know, see devastating levels of, of spread within COVID. It's by the occurrence of these feedbacks that we can fundamentally alter and in many cases control adverse system behavior. We exercise it all the time in daily tasks from going and get a drink of water when we're thirsty to eating when we're hungry uh, to you know, when we uh, uh, drive a vehicle or we get a bad grade and we study harder. Um, causal loop diagrams illustrate this process, but the, the fundamental notation will carry over to our quantitative diagrams. And that's why I'm, I'm illustrating it here. So, you know, if you're hungry, it tends, all other things being equal, that's the plus to increase um, your, your likelihood to go ingest food. And uh, by so doing, you reduce, that's the minus side, uh, the hunger. Um, it's by ingesting food, um, it will tend to lower um, hunger compared to where it would have been without ingesting food, all other things remaining equal. Um, so if you're not changing something else. And, and these, these diagrams and indeed these loops, they, they focus on conveying these feedback effects, okay? And there's a formal definition of them which uh, explicates in mathematical terms using uh, partial derivatives for those who have encountered them. Um, to express these relationships um, and you know, a negative polarity arrow uh, from A to B will indicate if A increases, B will tend to decrease compared to what it would have been had A not increased. Uh, doesn't mean it goes down over time, it's just it's lower than it would have been um, you know, in assuming all other things haven't changed. Um, and a plus from A to B indicates if A increases, B will tend to decrease above what it would have been otherwise uh, if A hadn't increased. Um, and uh, it, will, it will do so holding all of the things um, constant, okay? And I've, I've explicated that here and it's in the slides that I posted to Moodle. Um, okay, so um, I, I think I'll go light on this. Uh, often we knit together these causal loop diagrams into pieces where we have what are called causal pathways or, or, or pathways of uh, uh, me mechanistic pathways, they're sometimes called, by which one factor can influence others. And not surprising, there's often many such pathways. So overtime, for example, can allow you to have more time working, which may increase your work accomplished per day, but it can also lead to fatigue, which lowers your efficiency, which, which pushes back against that effect and lowers work accomplished per day through that pathway compared to what it otherwise would have been. Um, and, and similarly, it leads to incorporation of tasks outside of work. Um, we're going light in this material because it's not our focus, but I want you to learn how to, how to you know, re understand what these, these, these loops mean. And I'm glad to explicate it further during office hours. Um, so these loops indicate feedback. Um, 
And um, if you want to understand uh, the, the polarity associated with a little loop, um, say a loop like this, um, it's particularly easy. Um, we just take the product of signs, right? Uh, you surely know the, the rule for the product of signs, even if you don't know it by that name. Uh, if you multiply a negative number, oh, sorry, a positive number by a positive number, you get a positive number. A positive by a negative number, you get a negative number. A negative number by a positive number, you get a negative number. And a negative number by a negative number, you get a what? Positive. Yeah, positive okay. number. Thank you. I, I appreciate the Stentorian youth who 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 raised uh, uh, raised his uh, his uh, his hand there. Um, much appreciated. Um, okay, so one of the reasons I'm emphasizing this because the main reason or a central reason here is because this has dynamic quantitative implications, and there's a reason for it in terms of. Uh, uh, differential equations involved that we may explicate at some point. But basically, positive feedback loops. When we say positive, it doesn't mean it's good. It's not positive, like positive energy, you know, positive messaging. It's, it's positive in the sense that it's reinforcing. It's, it's, it's a plus arrow, um, but that doesn't mean it's great. It means that, um, you know, if, if I have an increase in, in one factor, it'll tend to ripple around in a way that will further increase that factor, okay? Um, it's kind of like, uh, okay, if you have a case of COVID-19, that case can, uh, that, that if you have an individual is infected, that can lead to uh, a greater number of new infections, which will even further increase the number of individuals infected. That's a vicious cycle, we'll sometimes call it when it's negative. And that's it's flip can be a virtuous cycle. That's what companies aim after when they're increasing their market share, for example. They want their increase in market share to give them opportunities, resources to, to create better products, make people let people know about them so they can further increase market share. So we can have these reinforcing feedbacks in many, many cases. Um, but what it leads to is divergent behavior. It leads to a situation where the situation goes in a certain direction it becomes unstable and, and rises in a certain direction faster and faster and faster. Think about breeding lemmings, right? Um, or rabbits breeding in Northern Saskatchewan um, in the time of, of the Hudson Bay trappers. Um, uh, or think about number of COVID cases when an outbreak is not properly controlled. Um, uh, here, we have a stock and you know we talk about doubling time of the stock it rises exponentially um, over time, okay? By contrast, a balancing loop is associated with, um, uh, with situations uh, where it's regulated. Think my balancing of that uh, rod in my finger. Uh, I bring it under control. I bring its divergence under control by moving my hand and bring it back into stasis. So here, you know, we might have an initial growth but through massive public health efforts and messaging and public health orders, uh, appropriate measures in place, faster uh, tracing, uh, uh, better drive-through centers, et cetera, uh, we, we put a cap on how, how fast it rises and we limit it. And this pattern, which we see here, this, um, this kind of exponential, um, negative exponential growth, uh, where in this case, it's one minus, uh, e to the minus alpha t, if, if, um, and we'll, we'll see that later um, in a later lecture, likely. Uh, this, is, this characterizes these negative feedbacks. You get a divergence from its desired value, say 1,000, and that divergence leads to a, a temporary departure, but then it's brought back towards its kind of state of balance, its equilibrium, its homeostasis. These are all different words referring to that. And you know, in truth, um, um, the situations are often more complex. If we have a negative uh, feedback with a delay, as we'll see, it leads to oscillations, okay? Um, and if we have uh, a given system which has pluses and minus uh, feedbacks, that is reinforcing feedbacks and balancing feedbacks, again, which is the reinforcing feedback here? Is it the positive or the minus? Positive. Yeah, it's the positive feedback. 
think a given change amplifies further, it adds to by rippling around that original change, right? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, someone who's, who's uh, uh, lost their, their income um, might feel uh, that they're, unnecess- they're, they're unable to keep their, their car up um, and, and, and maintain it. So their, their car no, becomes no longer available. Maybe if they, they have to sell it off, that limits their job options more, that limits their ability to, to bring in income, which furthers that cycle. That's, that's a, the, the reinforcing feedback and it's labeled with a plus. A negative feedback indicates a what sort of feedback? A, begins with a B, ends with a G. Balancing. Balancing, it's a balancing yeah. feedback, thank you. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that tends to bring under control. And what you see here is, is kind of a, a shift in dominance over time, where early on you might have, think COVID, cases multiplying quickly before the outbreak is well controlled, it starts to take off, and then you get the impact of the public health efforts, the impact of people's risk perception, keeping them inside, another form of, of negative feedback. You have the public health system and you have the private health system, as it were, which is internal um, uh, and might might cause us to avoid going out when it's going gangbusters outside. Um, and that brings it under control and you get this kind of, uh, this behavior where it can, can plateau. Um, very, very, very common things. And you see them in all sorts of different areas. Um, so often we, we end up uh, knitting together these diagrams um, in, in a quite articulated way. Um, uh, for for different occasions, um, uh, they can be used for all sorts of insight and, and different spheres. Whether it's uh, social policy, um, um, in in health, to be sure, but also in things like uh, software development and software management. Uh, I I teach on most semesters. Uh, last semester, because of my secondment to the health system, was an exception. CMPT three seventy one. Um, I teach uh, project management for large project teams. And one of the reasons it's, it, it, it works so well with um, all my expertise is because you're confronting the challenges of a complex system there. Complexity in the form of the need to coordinate and the need to communicate effectively and the need to, to regulate unobserved quantities like uh, software quality issues, bugs uh, within the code base that go unnoticed. Um, and, uh, and the need to navigate this within the human constraints involved. It's a socio-technical system. The technical concerns are big, but the social side of it, the human side is actually huge. And you get into issues of, of fatigue, for example, and, and you know, uh, burnout and, and people's loss of morale and leaving a product, a project um, and leaving others to clean it up and their morale going down further. And there's fascinating dynamics associated with that that I've covered in some inter- instances of 371 and other instances, ladies and gentlemen, of this very class. Um, but um, uh, here I think I'll, I'll go lighter and I just wanna emphasize that all of these reasonings fit into these quantitative measures we use where we we um, weave them together with, um, with quantitative uh, constructs such as stock and, flow di- uh, stock and flow diagrams we're gonna get into. And that brings us, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, the very gateway, the very transom to uh, the issue of model formulation. Model mapping, this is really an exercise in quickly sketching out things so we can get feedback, think through the issues, um, get a broad understanding of, of the phenomena we're trying to trying to capture and make sure our stakeholders see see it in, in, in ways that are um, see eye to eye with us. We, we can communicate more effectively with these sort of diagrams. Um, they serve as boundary objects to discuss a system where even if I'm from a different background than you, we can kind of point to things in the system and have a common shared understanding of many aspects. Model formulation is getting into quantitative model formulation, um, but it draws on some of these same elements of notation, like illustrating these feedbacks, as we'll see. 
Um, okay, so model formulation elaborates on a problem mapping typically to yield a fully specified quantitative model. At least that's very much the pattern within system dynamics. And uh, you know, here we're specifying particularly uh, equations for flows. Um, we're mapping out in more detail what, what's a stock and what's a flow. Um, delineating intermediate quantities, which are useful to reason about, et cetera. Now, the two big, big building blocks here are, are in system dynamics are twofold, okay? Um, uh, I sometimes speak about system dynamics uh, being the knowledge, harking to a ro Russian proverb, system dynamics is the knowledge of a hedgehog. Um, it knows one or two things really, really well and applies them. Agent-based modeling is the knowledge of a fox. It knows lots and lots of little things, um, uh, but doesn't dwell overly on, on any, any one of them. In, in system dynamics modeling, our two build, building blocks are stocks and flows, okay? Stocks represent accumulations in the world. Um, uh, they can vary from uh, very real accommodations like water in our bathtub, um, uh, to you know, or a, a a pile of 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 dirt that's been dug up in our backyard, um, to uh, things that are conceptual accumulations. You know, the balance in our bank account, the number of people uh, currently in the ICU of the hospital, the intensive care unit or critical care unit. Um, these stocks capture they 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 uh, express um, and they collectively characterize. The state of the system. So if you if you know the values of the stocks at any one time, you know everything there is about the current state of the system. If you saved away that information, wrote it down, terminated your simulation model at that point, uh, you could come back tomorrow or whenever you'd like next year, put in those values and run it forward and it would exactly go forward. They completely characterize what is the situation at this point in time so that um, you know, any forward uh, change uh, is dependent on that. Remember, dynamic systems are systems where what happens in the next little bit depends on what is the case now. This is, the stocks are what is the case now. It's the state of the system. They can be measured at an instant of time. You could measure the number, the amount of water in your bathtub. You could measure you know, the number of people in the ICU or the number of people in the hospital. And if you were extremely laborious, you could go through the entirety of Saskatchewan uh, performing tests and get a pretty darn good understanding of the number of people who are still susceptible to COVID. Um, these are all stocks. We can, we can measure them. Um, uh, they, they have a particular value for a specific moment in time. Stocks uh, start with an initial value within system dynamics models. We specify an initial value for them. And after that, we don't need to directly specify rules for their evolution. It's implied. And, and whence is it implied? How is it implied? It's implied by the flows that flow into and out of them, okay? Um, we just specify the initial value. After that, it's all up to the flows. Um, we don't write an equation for how the stock evolves over time. That's all given by the flows. It's all induced. It's all entailed by the values of the flows. Now, stocks, though, should not be viewed as second-class citizens. Far from it. Often they're front and center in our interest. They're the source of delay in a system. Um, they're the source of inertia. Um, it's because we have to fill up a stock that we have to stay so long at a gas station, for example. Um, it's because we have to draw down a stock of infective people in Saskatchewan that lockdowns have to stay in place for longer. Um, they, they lead to uh, inertia. You know, um, the current president of the United States, whose, whose tenure is measured in hours, remaining tenure, um, has squirreled away his uh, followers into various agencies, and they will impose a source of inertia in the new president um, and vice president Joe Biden and Kamala Harris getting started um, because it'll take a time to, to uh, you know, uh, replace them and, and, and move on to uh, more reliable appointees. Um, stocks are all around us. And I, I've listed a bunch here and I won't dwell on this, but uh, you may wish to after class or uh, I'd be glad to discuss these later. But um, 
they are ubiquitous, often they're of central interest in comparing against empirical quantities, um, and uh, they're familiar um, uh, to us. They're often things we can point at, you know, the beds in the emergency room that are, that are filled by patients right now. Um, in a stock and flow diagram, as is the type of diagram we build for quantitative system dynamics, stocks are indicated with these boxes, these rectangles. They're sometimes called levels or sometimes called state variables. Different subcommunities have different ways of referring to them. Um, and often they're, they're joined together in, in what uh, can sometimes be called uh, uh, staging chains or, or, or aging chains when they have to do with aging. These, these stages say uh, a person goes through according to the natural history of infection. Someone's susceptible, maybe after some time they become, they get infected and, and they become infectious and then they become temporarily immune. Um, sometimes those stocks can be disconnected. Like this is a kind of cumulative illness whose job in life it is to total up the new infections over time or to, more, to be more precise about it mathematically, it integrates it up. Time here is continuous. And this is an integral of new illnesses. Cumulative illnesses is an integral over time of new illnesses. Flipping that around, the derivative of, the first order derivative of cumulative illness is new illnesses. Um, uh, D cumulative illness DT equals uh, uh, new illnesses. Um, so that's the rate of change uh, of, of uh, cumulative illnesses, okay? These flows between stocks, like new infections, um, new recovery, uh, lead a certain number of people over time to go from susceptible to infectious or from infectious to temporarily immune. Um, the stocks are the, these, uh, these ones highlighted in red. Um, and stocks, you know, they're, they're, their importance cannot be overstated. They determine the current state of the system. They're central to most disequilibria phenomena slowness and, and keeping a, of stopping an outbreak, um, the, the amount of time it takes to keep a, a lockdown in place, um, to drain the number of people who are infective, the amount of time that our uh, ICUs are over capacity um, is, is determined by the stock of people in them and how that changes over time. Uh, and they give rise to big delays, um, in delays in, in things having an effect. Um, now, the thing though that drives stock values is flows, okay? All changes to stocks, all changes to say the number of people infectious here are driven by the flows in and the flows out, new infections in and new recoveries out. If there were no new infections in, the number of people who are infected wouldn't suddenly go to zero. It would have to drain out over time through recoveries. Just like, and you could remember, this is like a valve here, recoveries, it's like an outflow. Imagine you're, you have water coming into your tub and you have water going out of your tub and suddenly you turn off the water going, coming into your tub. Maybe your tub's halfway full already. You turn off the water coming in. It's still gonna take a while for that tub to, to decline. Uh, it has to flow out. If the tub starts empty, um, then it will, you know, water will come in with the faucet coming in through new infection. But just like the water in the tub, the number of people who are infectious uh, is driven by the inflows and outflows here, okay? Um, all changes to stocks occur via flows. Um, and flows are a somewhat more subtle a somewhat more textured quantity than stocks. Um, they're the two building blocks, uh, but these are the verbs. The stocks are the nouns, okay? Um, and, and verbs can be more, um, often more varied and more evocative in their terms. Um, uh, so uh, one thing about flows that makes them um, perhaps a little bit tricky for students to, to reason about initially is, you know, if we have a flow, Let's say the number of new infections. Um, you, you know, if, if you went up to, if I went up to you, um, or if you, if someone came up to me on the street and they said, you know, Ottawa's in real trouble. Um, there were 
you know, uh, a thousand new infections. The, you know, there's a key piece of miss of information missing. If if you told me Ottawa's in real trouble, there are a thousand people in the ICU. That that that's the stock value. Um, that that tells me a lot. Right now, there's a thousand people in the ICU. But if you come up to me and talk about a flow, there's a thousand people um, who got infected, uh, newly infected. I need to ask you one more piece of information. Over what period of time? If you're talking over the last month, my concern will drop a lot. If you're talking over the last hour, I'll be really, really, really concerned. If you're talking over the last day, I'll be pretty concerned as well. Um, so flows are all, always need to be expressed per some amount of time, per some time unit. You can choose your time unit per second, per hour, per day, per week, per month, per year. Um, but um, you need to you need to specify for that for the information to be um, uh, to be meaningful, even in civil engineering terms, right? If someone were to tell me, "Wow, the South Saskatchewan River is mighty; it has a flow of three million cubic meters," I'd say, "Per what?" per second, per day, per month, um, you need to fill that in. Flows, in short, are always per unit time. And in a way, they're, if we freeze time right now, we can't measure them directly, right? If you froze, God forbid, um, not just the surface of the South Saskatchewan River, but its entirety, um, there goes next summer's fishing season, um, uh, it would, um, you know, if you if you froze it in time, you you can't measure flow because flows a change. It's it's change over time. It has to measure the amount of water going past a certain point, say, an amount of time. So flows have to be measured over a certain period of time. And the common way we measure flows, you know, some years ago I drove a well um, on our land, and um, you know, to to figure out what's the rate of flow I got out of it, how did I do that? Well, I I, I saw, you know, how much of a bucket could I fill up in 60 seconds of pumping? And that gave me a, a certain sense of flow. Um, alternatively, I could measure how long it is until I fill up the entire bucket. That would be another way to measure it. But the point is it's water per unit time. I need to measure time as well. I, I, I actually fill up an accumulation. So we typically measure these by some accumulation and some stock that starts, starts empty conceptually. Um, uh, so flows are a little bit subtle um, for many students to get their heads around. Uh, think about, you know, your uh, your income. Um, if you told someone my income is two hundred dollars, um, if I told you my income is two hundred dollars, you shouldn't say, "Wow, why is Osgood so poor?" You should say, "Is that per second? <laughs> is that per hour? Um, uh, what what have you?" And um, and, and this is, again, something that's, um, that's quite critical to flows. So we have lots of flows. I won't go into this, but often it, we, we give hints when we talk about a rate that it's a flow. Um, uh, so, you know, a rate of recovery, a rate of mortality, you know, the number of people per year, the rate of births, uh, how many births we have. Now, rate's a little bit tricky because it can also express something per unit time that's dimensionless. And we'll talk about that a bit. But all of these are examples of flow. For those who are more physically oriented, power in watts is, is flow. A kilowatt hours, by contrast, is a stock. It can, be, can quantify a stock. OK, so here's our flows in our model. Uh, we have flows sometimes occurring from one stock to the other, uh, sometimes occurring from this cloud, which just means it's outside the scope of the model. We don't consider it, OK? Um, and uh, it's, it lies outside the scope of the model. We're not going to worry about where, whence it comes, um, only in this case, whither it goes. And um, you can also have flows going out of a stock into a cloud um, that, that indicates it's you know, flowing out into something outside the model. Okay? Um, so we can have stocks arranged in, in sequence. We can have them arranged separately. Um, here, these are more physiological stocks. And you know the overall pattern here should be clear. Look, um, flows dictate change in stocks, OK? 
um, how a stock will change, how much money is coming to my bank account from interest will depend on how much money, you know, per month, it will depend on how much money is in my bank account in the first place, right? It depends on the stock, the accumulation, the flow depends on the stock, excuse me, um, excuse me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I jumped ahead of myself. We'll deal with the, um, the white side of yin yang first. Um, flows dictate change of stock. So, um, you know, if, if, I have, uh, if I have no new illnesses, the number of cumulative illnesses won't rise. If there's zero new illnesses, cumulative illnesses will stay constant. The number of illnesses that have been the case since COVID first came in to our province, our fair province. Um, uh, or, you know, if I have, um, uh, if I have uh, no, one, uh, no one recovering and no one getting newly infected, the number of uh, infected people will, uh, will stay the same. Um, so uh, here we have flows dictating the change in stocks. I told you, all you have to specify for stock is the initial value. Everything else after that is dictated by the flows into and out of it. It's dictated by the net flow. Some of the flows in minus some of the flows out. I'm throwing a lot at you and hoping you can study this lecture. Um, by contrast, stocks determine flows. Um, and this is where I got ahead of myself. Look, um, if there's nobody, to, to illustrate this point, that it's not merely flows drive stocks, but stocks drive flow. Consider recoveries. Let's consider that case, okay? Um, how many recoveries if there, are there going to be if there's no one infective at all? How many recoveries are going to occur of people if there's nobody to recover? Anyone want to proffer an answer? This is a, a low ball. Zero? Yeah, zero. By contrast, if I told you fully half of Saskatchewan, about 600,000 people are infected. You'd expect a lot of recoveries per day. You'd say, wow, it's really bad, but it, you know, COVID duration of, of infection that someone has an actively transmissible infection is bounded by weeks. And so if you had 600,000 people infected, you'd, you'd expect quite a few recoveries per day occurring, you know, suppose, and it's not, but suppose COVID's total, you know, um, uh, length of infective infection was uh, 10 days, were 10 days, um, you might expect naively, um, you know, people who are infective at different stages of their infection, about 10% of them will get better per day, 10% um, of the last day of their infection, 10% on the second to last day, the penultimate day, and so on, 10% are in their first day. Um, uh, so the value of infectives, of infectious, the number of infectious people dictate the value of the stock. Similarly, there's going to be no new infections unless there are, actually, no, this is the interesting, most interesting one, two things going on. What do we need for new infections to occur? Anyone? We need some number of people who are what? Not Susceptible. Susceptible, first of all. There's got to be people who can be infected, someone who, who's susceptible to infection. And then there's got to be at least one what? Infectious. Infectious person to infect them, right? Um, so it takes two to tango. Um, here, we need an infectious and a susceptible person to yield a new infection. So this is yet another example of how flows can depend on, need, typically depend on the value of stocks. Um, uh, some stocks, some aspect of the state of the system. Okay. Um, uh, you know, put another way, I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense if recoveries were independent of the number of people infected. I mean, if there were zero people infected, you're telling me recoveries would still be occurring. What is that going to do? It's going to make negative people infective. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't make sense otherwise, right? Um, Okay, so stocks determine flows. The state of the system determines what will happen next. I said that in my very first lecture. That's the character of a dynamic system. What is the case now determines what may be in the near future. Um, and that will hold against across all three traditions.
we'll express it differently. Sometimes we'll be probabilistic here. It's deterministic, but, but it carries over. And flows dictate change in stocks. And then we have some auxiliary variables, which are convenience names, just like good software engineering uses intention communicating names. Donald Knuth talks about literate programming, programming that, that um, is at once expressive, transparent, easily comprehended, easily communicable, um, where we, we use appropriate uh, naming. It's, it's clearly laid out in a logical structure that can be easily explicated, broken up into small pieces. And we have similar principles within our, our model. So for example, we'll create constructs like the total population, which instead of every time we need to refer to the total population, we sum up susceptible, infectious, and temporarily immune because those are the different divisions of the population. That's the number of susceptible, the number of infectious, the number of temporarily immune people. Instead of writing that formula every time, that expression, we, we have a we have a uh, intermediate quantity, um, sometimes called an auxiliary variable called total population that, that summarizes that. It's convenience uh, there for, for writing down the, uh, the formulas in nicer ways. The prevalence of infection, the fraction of people that are infective at any one time is then infectious divided by total population. Mathematically, it all unpacks to infectious divided by quantity susceptible plus infectious plus temporarily immune, but we can write it for convenience as infectious divided by total population, knowing full well the total population is the sum of susceptible infectious and temporarily immune people. Okay, um, so these are auxiliary variables. They're critical for model transparency. Often we'll graph them, we'll you know save them away, we'll create a table of them, we'll output them. Um, they're convenient for reporting, convenient for human understanding. Here are some, here are some such variables. Um, now, what I haven't emphasized here, um, helping to work to, to minimize the distractions here is um, highlighting feedbacks. The feedbacks, ladies and gentlemen, are legion. They are writ large here. Um, and, uh, this diagram is actually a little bit different, but we have feedbacks associated with each outflow whoa, from those stocks. Um, as we have more infectives, we'll have more recoveries, and that will tend to lower the number of infectives. There's actually a negative feedback there that, that is joining infectives and recoveries. Number of infectives goes up, it'll tend all other things being equal to increase the number of recoveries compared to the value it otherwise would have had. Um, as the number of recoveries goes up, it'll tend to decrease the number of infectives compared to the value it otherwise would have had all other things being equal. Um, so there's an out for every outflow, there's a negative feedback uh, when that outflow depends, as is most common, on the value of the stock which it drains uh, the stock whence it comes. Um, by contrast, there's some positive feedbacks in this diagram. For example, that joining infectives and, infect and, and infections. They were a little bit more articulated here, a little bit uh, less direct, but you increase number of infectious people, you have a higher prevalence of infection, that leads to more infectious contacts per susceptible per year, a higher force of infection and more new infections. And that further increases, you can see the flow into infectious that further reinforces that vicious cycle. In, in short, infectious people breed new infections, which breed new infections. And if you put a, put a polarity on each of these links, infectious to prevalence of infection, it'll be a positive link. Prevalence of infection to mean infectious contacts per susceptible per year plus that to force of infection plus, that to new infections plus, and new infections to infectious because it flows into it plus. Um, and that will lead to a vicious cycle, a, a, a reinforcing feedback. Um, divergent number of infections rise. By contrast with new infections flowing out of susceptibles, new infections will tend to drain the number of susceptibles. So if you have more susceptibles, 
you have fewer new infections, which will tend to drain susceptibles. And that's a negative feedback. And you'll see them illustrated here, even though the details of the diagram are, are a bit different. Okay, now within system dynamics more generally, and within uh, applications such as infectious disease modeling, uh, more specifically, but, but generally for, for a lot of textured complex systems. Um, we have a phenomenon that I've mentioned before in, in lecture one, not lecture zero, which is administrivia, but lecture one on that, that first day. Um, the phenomenon is, is termed nonlinearity. Um, and I had alluded to it there. I said, look, it's, it's a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, or you, it's not reducible to the sum of its parts. You can't take it apart, understand each, each of its pieces and expect to understand the whole. And that's kind of hand wavy, but, but it actually uh, highlights uh, an important truth. Um, it is about that. Um, but it's actually simultaneously uh, more precise uh, than that. And in our lectures through uh, system dynamics modeling and talking about nonlinearity, we'll explicate it mathematically. Um, but what, what it really means is um, uh, if you have, if you consider the system, say, considered with just susceptibles in it, um, and and consider how that would evolve. No, in fact, it's just susceptibles. And then you were to add to that to how it behaves, the response of how the system will behave with just the, the infectives in it, no susceptibles. Um, you sum those up, thinking you're examining the superposition of them. You're going to get something very different than if you have consider how the system will behave when you have susceptibles and infectives in it. So if I can say it mathematically briefly, for those who are, are keeners mathematically, f of x, uh, f of quantity x plus y uh, is not equal to f of x plus f of y. That common homomorphism breaks down. Uh, the homomorphism holds for, for, for linear systems, where f of x plus y quantity is equal to f of x plus x y, uh, plus f of y. And you may say, well, that, that's a weird factoid. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll drop this class now. But, um, but it turns out this has profound implications because we take the world apart into our x plus y's. In engineering, we do linear systems analysis where we take a signal apart into a sum of, of sines and cosines and so on. And and we understand how the system behaves with respect to each of those. And that tells us, we just sum up that behavior with respect to each of those to get the behavior with respect to the whole. And you can't do that here. You can't consider simplifying your life, divide and conquer, we'll only consider susceptibles. And then separately, we'll only consider infectives. And we know how it will behave with respect to all of them. And it ain't gonna work that way any more so than if you just simulated each person's life path in isolation of all other individuals who will tell you how they'll all, how societally will all behave. Um, so nonlinearity has profound consequences. It's, it's philosophically important, but it's profoundly important at a practical level um, as well. And uh, amongst other things it implies we have to, we can't write down a closed form solution to what, how these systems will evolve. We can't write down a formula for how they're gonna change over time. The only way we can characterize it is by simulating them, much as uh, Turing, um, the, the limits associated with Turing completeness um, uh, prevent us from saying if a program will halt ahead of time. The only way we can determine um, if it, uh, if it does halt, uh, would be to run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, in hopes of seeing, oh yeah, it eventually halts. Um, but knowing that we may never get there. We may be one femtosecond short when we stop it. Um, okay, so uh, nonlinearity has many consequences. And one of them is these systems are devilishly hard to control, to reason about, to understand. And um, our, our normal intuitions break down really, uh, really poorly. Okay. Um, now, uh, you know, a, a key need here is often to represent heterogeneity. And I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, 
uh, how heterogeneity is handled here. Um, it's handled uh, through uh, breaking a system up into separate, oh, I shouldn't say breaking it up, it's it, by duplicating stocks. So if we had, for example, we really need to distinguish um, uh, the spread of infection in low income groups versus high income groups, what we would need to do is have susceptibles for high income, susceptibles for low income, infectious for high income, infectious for low income. You kind of get the pattern, um, temporarily immune for each of them. And we need to account for the fact, of course, low income people mix with high income people and high income people mix with low income people. They may you know, live in distinct homes, lower income people are saddled with more crowded homes, often poor ventilation, which can spread the infection more, but we need to consider their interaction. And so it is uh, with, with these models. Um, and heterogeneity, this kind of situation where the system we're characterizing has um, real differences in different parts of it. We, we need to uh, uh, here uh, di disaggregate the model it's called, meaning kind of uh, uh, duplicate parts of it to relate to those different sub pieces. And then we can always sum them up uh, as we simulate each of those subpieces to get an understanding for for it as a whole, um, uh, we'll come back to that in a big way, and it'll be one of the big contrasts with agent-based modeling uh, a bit later in the course. But I want to talk about, in terms of our tour through system dynamics models, one more type of thing you see in a system dynamics models. If we sort of get an understanding of the landscape within a system dynamics model. Um, um, a tourist guide to system dynamics model. The final sort of, of variable you'll see there are parameters, okay? And parameters express um, assumptions, um, an assumption about a given quantity. Um, this is an exogenous factor. Remember before I talked with you in the last lecture, I contrasted three types of ways that dynamic models independent of tradition can um, can deal with quantities in the world. Way one, it's endogenous. The system generates it, it calculates it. The system tells us what it is, not we tell it what it is because it's calculating as part of its job. So susceptibles here, infectious, temporarily immune people, cumulative illnesses, new infections, new recoveries, newly susceptibles. Um, a force of infection, mean infectious contacts per year. Um, these are all endogenous quantities. It's calculating them. If I run this model and I run it out, lickety split, um, it's going to be having um, trajectories, values for the number of susceptibles, the count of susceptibles over time, uh, which I'm not going to be telling to it. It tells me what will result from my assumptions. And endogenous quantities are often the, the motivator for why we build these models. We, we want it. We want to get insights. We want to know, is the behavior seen in this model consistent with what I see in the, in the world? So I know if the theory captured by the model is, is consistent with the world. I can debug my thinking, remember. But we have another type of way these models can deal with with representing variables in the world. They're represented, but they're not calculated by the model. We here for endogenous quantities, that first type, the model tells us about them. For the second type, exogenous quantities, we tell the model about them. Examples, recovery delay, immunity delay, um, the assumption that the probability of transmission for a given contact between an infective and susceptible. Um, we, we put in an assumption about this. We impose some assumption. Sometimes it turns out it's actually a behavior over time, but it's a pre-specified behavior. It's not generated by the model, but I tell it, you know, the number of vaccines that will be available over time uh, throughout 2021 will be this, go figure. Um, these are pre-specified things that are exogenous. I'm telling it to the model. Uh, parameters are perhaps the most common example, and, and broadly we'll call those all parameters at a certain level. These are these assumptions. So here they're they're constant values, they're double, you know, precision values in this particular model. 
um, but they're 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 scalar constants. Um, in some cases, we specified numbers, and these these data can be gotten from all sorts of places, um, uh, from best guesses by experts to systematic reviews, meta analyses, uh, data from from clinical trials or from uh, from published studies, previously published studies, or or studies we run. For example, we have uh, we have run many many studies with smartphones within Saskatchewan, catching catching um, aspects of people's contact patterns with each other. These are all people who agree to it, uh, all consenting adults, and and we can you know get some understanding of how people mix within Saskatchewan, for example, um, or how likely they are to go to a to visit a clinician or get tested. Um, if they have symptoms of COVID. Um, so often within these models, we have lots of these assumptions characterized as parameters. Note that I'm, diff I'm distinguishing a parameter from a variable. A variable is an aspect of state typically. And I try to be very careful about how I use the term. It varies over time. Parameter specifies an assumption. It's, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a uh, specific assumption I make, okay? Um, now, we're drawing towards the end of the of the, the this sort of brief overview, but I wanna highlight um, um, a key point which on which we'll be drawing in spades in coming lectures, not the next two, which will do this whirlwind tour, similar whirlwind tour for agent-based modeling on the one hand and, and discrete event simulation on the other. But this is more a, a, a preview of, of we're going into greater detail on system dynamics modeling post, um, um, post that, that coverage. Um, we're, we're explicating it in many lectures and using it to understand the principles of nonlinear systems, for example. Um, so if we have a system such as we've been depicting, um, we need to recognize this is all nice and good. And actually these sort of diagrams, these stock and flow diagrams can be great for communicating with stakeholders who are not modelers and who would be scared or, or find it unappetizing to see the mathematics behind them. But we need to recognize that indeed underlying all of this is a precise mathematical foundation laid on the solid mathematical bedrock of something called ordinary differential equations, which has been, um, uh, which, which is uh, bequeathed to us by Newton and by Leibniz um, from the 1600s, 1700s. Um, so here we can take a model like this, we can use convenience short notation for it, S for susceptibles, uh, I for infectious or infective, R for recovered, N for the total number of people in the population, a average duration of infectiousness, mu, um, uh, number of contacts per susceptible per, I should say per day, um, or per unit time, C, et cetera. And then we write down, we, we more or less transliterate this into a set of differential equations, into a set of, of, of derivatives. Now, for those who haven't seen this before, you shouldn't panic, but you should realize that some maturity will be required to understand this. So uh, S dot, I dot, R dot indicate um, for each of susceptible infected, infective individuals and recovered individuals, uh, respectively, the rates of change of that. So how many people per day is susceptible going up um, by um, the number of susceptibles? Well, it's the number of people per day coming in um, uh, from immigration, let's say, minus the number of people per day um, leaving because they're getting sick, um, they're no longer susceptible. Um, uh, you know, it might be easier to think about this on a, um, um, on a longer time frame, but sticking with the day um, day thing, if we had 20 people come in in a given day to Saskatchewan uh, who are susceptible and 10 people getting infective, the number of susceptibles will go up by 10 over the course of that day, 20 in, 10 out, 
it'll go up by 10. Maybe it was already 1.2 million and now it's 1.2 million and, and 10. Um, uh, so the number of susceptibles, the rate of change on susceptibles um, per day is the number of people coming in minus the number of people going out. Okay, that looks like two minus signs. It's just overlapping with the with the uh, the highlighting here. Now you'll notice there's certain colors here. These colors correspond to oh my gosh, oh no, oh gosh, it's uh, okay, okay. There we go. Uh, okay, sorry, didn't mean to melt down in front of you. So. Um, these colors correspond uh, to this flow. So this flow here from susceptible to, to uh, infective corresponds to this, um, uh, this uh, pair of elements of, um, uh, in, this, in this set of uh, equations. So there's a flow out from susceptible associated with this. And the same number of people who float out from susceptible go into infective. So it's associated with a plus sign, just not written here for the rate of change of infectives. So if there was nobody starting infective, I was zero, this will say the rate of change of I, how many people per day it goes up by, if I could abuse English, apologies, um, uh, will be the number of people coming in per day um, say over the course of that day, minus the number of people leaving through recovery over the course of the day. If I was zero, well, okay, now we're now I'm you know pickle because nobody's be getting infected if I have zero. I should have chosen susceptibles, but um, you kind of get the point. Um, so this uh, number of people flowing between the two, um, uh, if it at once flows out of susceptible and into infected. And similarly, this flow, recovery, flows out of infectives and in, into, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the recovered stock. And, um, and hence, it's, it's shown as in, in blue corresponding to these two terms. These terms of, are of necessity identical because they correspond to the same flow. Okay. Um, and this allows for all sorts of wonderful analyses and, and high level understandings about how the system can possibly behave, its long-term behavior, um, these kind of uh, cases where it can get trapped in certain port points, think of them as vortex states where it's really hard to escape from, think about the cycle of poverty, for example, or someone who's gotten really sick from COVID and and it's losing sleep and their immune system is, is worse off because of that. And it's harder for them to, to clear the bug because of that. Um, uh, think about lock-in states where people get trapped or just think about states where it approaches some equilibrium with some oscillation. That's what we see there. So you can do wonderful analytics and this has been butchered a bit in this version of uh, PowerPoint. Um, and uh, these sort of formal approaches allow us to to really get a lot of insight about why we see certain behavior under what conditions, for example, what vaccination conditions, uh, there'd be a qualitative difference, like the infection disappearing from our fair province. Um, under what condition, how many people would we need to be vaccinated to drive it out of, you know, out of circulation? Um, it can help us understand why we see certain oscillations and understand under what conditions we'll see it and under what conditions we won't. Um, uh, what, what aspects of our public health system might lower the, 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 um, the uh, frequency or the uh, magnitude of those oscillations. And we can understand how this behavior depends on uh, parameters, for example, so that we can design our system so that three years hence, four years hence, a decade hence, if someone comes in with COVID-19 to the Saskatoon airport, uh, we can be sure there won't lead to an outbreak. Um, we can design our systems to be robust, to be stable, to be self-stabilizing much as I was, you know, an hour ago with respect to this very rod. Um, we can bring the system into balance. Um, okay. Um, so within infectious disease dynamics, um, it's a nonlinear system and these sorts of feedbacks are writ large um, and uh, they often lead to um, shifting dominance in the feedbacks uh, within a given model 
uh, over time from one mode to a to another. Okay, so if you take uh, key take home messages in my final minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so system dynamics uh, focuses on feedbacks and really accumulations as the fundamental shapers of dynamics. We saw the two sides of that today, or saw it to each of those today. Uh, feedbacks coming in two major varieties, reinforcing and balancing. Reinforcing feedback being where a change kicks off a cascading series of changes that ripple around and, and amplify that original change. Think about divergence and the number of people infected. Um, uh, or think about the growth of a company that gets you know, good revenue and, and uh, can, um, can invest in, in better engineering for software engineering and, and so on. Um, oh, great. Uh, and, uh, and think about, uh, by contrast, balancing feedbacks, which are, uh, uh, which, where that given change pushes back against itself. Um, uh, models that we build for these purposes are specific to purpose. And I haven't emphasized that as much, but often in system dynamics, we're seeking to refine how we think about a system. We make use of more uh, high level models to help sharpen people's thinking so there's stakeholder clarity about them. It does include qualitative and quantitative components. And I gave just the briefest of glimpse for qualitative ones. I might provide a video that, that better helps you understand that. I think that would be a good idea. But you've seen that those concepts of negative feedback or balancing feedback and reinforcing feedback, on the other hand, um, they play a role in the quantitative side as well. And indeed they're associated with behavior over time. Um, that can be profound in shaping the evolution of a system, driving that evolution. Whoa. Um, okay. Um, so system dynamics is designed to be articulated at a level, at a certain remove from a system. It doesn't get into, and this is in contrast to the next two traditions. Um, it doesn't get into the details of events typically you know, this particular person got infected, that particular person got infected. It, it stays at a certain aloofness from that, talking more about broad patterns, about rates of infection, and, and doesn't get into, oh, Joe got infected today, and, and Mary's, Mary did yesterday, and um, now most of their family's infected. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't get into that. Um, uh, it's one step removed, and um, it satisfies itself often with a with a broader overall view. Um, capturing heterogeneity is kind of awkward, and and this again accords with this uh, motivation for a broader view. If if you want to capture men differently than women, or you want to capture different age groups, it gets kind of cumbersome because you end up duplicating parts of your model in a fashion that's um, that's assisted by software. We, we use what's called subscripting, but it can get combinatorially very expensive. Um, and, and it means as you, as you add another dimension of heterogeneity, even just one more dichotomous thing, um, one more uh, you know, thing of possible binary outcomes, you double the size of your model and by extension, double the running time. Um, uh, so models often stay at this high level that communicates well with stakeholders and stakeholders often interact with them um, uh, in real time and, and, and can sharpen their thinking and, and try out ideas and, uh, and learn from the simulation model how to think more crisply and, and uh, deeply and quickly about, about a system. Um, they can be, uh, system dynamics can be applied at different levels of granularity. We've seen it at the level of here of aggregate. And that's how traditionally mostly it has been applied. That's the sphere in which it's mostly been applied. But it can also be applied at the level within a given agent, for example. And some early system dynamics models did exactly that within a company, for example. And when we get to hybrid modeling, you'll see that in spades. Uh, because we'll have system dynamics models within a given agent, for example, reflecting degree of, uh, of physical uh, dependence on opioid-related uh, drugs or, 
or uh, the level of viral load within a person um, or uh, changes in a person's income over time, um, et cetera. Um, these sort of models though finally are, are particularly powerful because they admit to formal reasoning that goes beyond what we can do with uh, agent-based and um, discrete event simulation models. Are the languages of, of mathematics, the, the frameworks by which to describe them are not standardized, not, um, uh, not, not widespread, don't enjoy widespread enough support to allow us to reason about those other sorts of models, so stochastic models with the level of clarity, depth of insight, uh, ease of, of manipulation and, and reasoning that we can with system dynamics. And indeed, together, ladies and gentlemen, as a group, we will be exploring the, uh, the application of, um, oh, uh, yes, I'm still recording. Okay, thank you. We will be exploring the implications of, uh, uh, of that sort of reasoning, that sort of mathematical reasoning in, in getting insights about, uh, about system behavior. Um, indeed, uh, a sigmoidal, uh, a sigmoidal curve uh, for those who, who, who operate, uh, operated on it. Okay, I, I see attendance was taken and I see, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, there was clapping. Maybe it was clapping with respect to how many people are filling in the attendance sheet. Um, okay. Um, uh, so uh, that closes my lecture. Um, I've gone uh, two minutes uh, over, um, uh, and uh, I uh, I would uh, like to transition um, now to uh, office hours, where I'm glad to answer questions um, about this lecture or more broadly about the course projects, etc. Uh, as I normally do, um, both for uh, my own sake and indeed for yours, um, I'd like to uh, take a couple minute break here. So I'll be back in about five minutes uh, with some uh, hot water and uh, ready to engage for the following hour. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to talking with some of you in the subsequent hour, Boyd by the fact that uh, many of you came to office hours last week and made it a lively session. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. And we'll continue on for those not coming to office hours with a discussion of agent-based modeling uh, at a similar whirlwind level next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>